Welcome to today's American Dental Education Association webcast titled Moving IPE Forward, the Role for Dental Education. It's now my pleasure to introduce our host, Dr. Eugene Anderson, who is the Chief Policy Officer and Managing Vice President of the American Dental Education Association. Dr. Anderson leads the IDEA Policy Center, which provides evidence-based research and analysis, collaborative advocacy, and thoughtful leadership. The IDEA Policy Center works through four targeted portfolios. First, to access, access diversity and inclusion. Second, advocacy and governmental relations. Third, educational research and analysis. And fourth, institutional capacity building. We are pleased that Dr. Anderson could join us and host today's webinar. Dr. Anderson, welcome to the program. Thank you, Kurt. We're fortunate to have with us today Dr. Judith Buchanan to share her expertise on the role for dental education in moving interprofessional education forward. Dr. Buchanan has served in a number of leadership positions throughout her distinguished career in dental education, most recently as the Interim Dean at the University of Minnesota School of Dentistry, and also as Director of the Center for Interprofessional Education at the same institution. Today's webinar will answer three important questions. Why does dental education need to incorporate interprofessional education, what are some of the best practices, and what can you do to get started at your home institution? Dr. Buchanan, welcome, and I'd like to start with the first question. Why does dental education need to incorporate IPE? Eugene, that's an excellent question, but to make sure we're all on the same page, I'd like to take a moment to review some important definitions. Definitions of an evolving field are challenging, even in one that's 40 years old. For example, if you reread the 1972 U.S. Institute of Medicine Educating for the Health Team Report, and except for just a few pronouns, it reads like a contemporary document from today. We believe the 2010 World World Health Organization definition and framework for IPE and collaborative practice are a good place to start. While many will quibble over a word or two, the framework is contemporary, grew out of a consensus process, builds upon many ideas, but also starts us thinking in new ways. As I'm sure some of you have heard before, the WHO definition of interprofessional education is when students from two or more professions learn about, from, and with each other to enable effective collaboration and improve health outcomes. The second half of that definition is the critical piece that we should focus on because IPE is a necessary step in preparing a collaborative, practice-ready health workforce that is better prepared to respond to local health needs. A collaborative, practice-ready health worker is someone who's learned how to work in an interprofessional team and is competent to do so. Now, if IPE is a necessary step for collaborative, practice-ready workforce, we need to understand what is meant by collaborative practice. Collaborative practice happens when multiple health workers from different professional backgrounds work together with patients, families, carers, and communities to deliver the highest quality of care. It allows health workers to engage any individual whose skills can help achieve local public health goals. Judith, thanks for making those distinctions for us. So how do these concepts fit specifically into dental education? Well, you just read my mind, Dr. Anderson. Let's return to the important question of why does dental education need to incorporate IPE? Here are some important reasons for dental schools to consider, and we will talk about each of these in more detail in just a moment. I have also listed, listed on this slide challenges that can be significant but can be overcome, as we will see in the second part of this webinar. Discussions of these challenges are a webinar in itself 
and unfortunately we don't have the time to address them today. The first reason listed on the last slide is health care reform, and its impact is significant. There is virtual universal agreement that health care is changing. The Affordable Care Act and individual state legislation are demanding interprofessional care. One driver of change is the establishment of accountable care organizations. An accountable a care organization, or an ACO, is a health care organization characterized by a payment and care delivery model that seeks to tie provider reimbursements to quality metrics and reductions in the total cost of care for an assigned population of patients. A group of coordinated health care providers forms an ACO, which then provides care to a group of patients. The ACO is accountable to the patients and the third-party payer for the quality, appropriateness, and efficiency of the health care provided. Health care reform will increase the need for dental services, especially for children. The public now demands better co collaboration, and I'm sure many of you have experiences where you wished your health care providers had better communication and exchange of in information. However, one of the biggest drivers for collaborative practice is that future financial incentives will be tied to care coordination and team management. In other words, health care providers will, will be paid for value incentivizing best health outcomes per unit cost versus paying for volume or procedures done. This is a whole different world for us in dentistry who are used to fees for service, and it's a major game changer for health care delivery. So, health care is changing. How does that impact dental education? As dental educators, we have a responsibility to understand how changes in health care will impact our graduates' careers. Will our graduates be practicing in the same way as past graduates? Probably not. As seen in medicine, where now over 50% of physicians are employees, large dental practices are steadily increasing and the career of a dentist practicing alone may not be the norm in the future. In fact, new dental graduates are three times more likely to seek employment in a large group practice than they were just a decade ago. Increased demand for dental services, especially in underserved areas, may push the role of mid-level providers, as well as change the scope of practice for dentists. With the emphasis on team-based care, oral health, and oral health care providers will be more closely aligned with general health and the medical team. As dental educators, we need to prepare our graduates to be valued, respected members of any interprofessional collaboration, not only for the benefit of patient care, but to ensure that our graduates will thrive in this new environment. In order to do this, we need to give our students the experiences in our curricula that will enable them to succeed in this changing health care environment. Now, nothing moves dental education as quickly or as surely as changes in our accreditation standards. Beginning in 2013, new standards were mandated, which include Standard 2-19. Graduates must be competent in communicating and collaborating with other members of the health care team to facilitate the provision of health care. Reading the intent of the standard, it's clear that dental education must include experiences in IPE. However, if you look at the introduction of the new standards, which is much more um, uh, much longer than in previous versions of the standard, there is a section on collaboration with other healthcare professionals that has some very interesting statements. One is that dental curricula can change to develop a new type of dentist. 
Those are strong words. It continues by stating that enhancing the public's access to oral health care and the connection of oral health to general health form a nexus that links oral health care providers to colleagues in other health professions. The last statement in this section is that dental education programs are to seek and take advantage of opportunities to educate dental school graduates who will assume new roles in safeguarding, promotion, and care, promoting and caring for the health care needs of the public. Reading this in the new accreditation standards, I really think it's clear that we must provide opportunities throughout our students' program to work with other health care professionals. Dr. Buchanan, tell us about the typical health professional schools that you see collaborating with dental schools and other academic dental institutions. Well, the links between dentistry, medicine, nursing, and pharmacy seem the most obvious. However, in my experience, dental students who are integrated with many different health professions find that they have a lot more connections with health professions than they ever expected. Developing an understanding of the roles and a respect for a broad range of health professions is a goal of IPE. It is also important that other health professions learn our potential and respect what we do. Hence, most leaders advocate involving as many health professions as possible in their IPE initiatives. Now, what if the dental school or academic dental institution doesn't have an obvious health education partner to collaborate with? Well, this is a concern, but there are several options. Often there are other health professional programs in the vicinity that are not associated with the university, but that can still be part of your IPE program. In fact, one good thing about the IPE movement is that it's helping break down barriers between different educational uh, institutions and programs. Also, health professional students located far apart can be brought together through technology. In Minnesota, we have medical and pharmacy students on several campuses located up to 200 miles apart, yet we evolve those students uh, through technology. It's not optimal, but it is doable. There are, uh, everybody in health professions is looking for someone to partner. So people are very open to establishing new relationships. Uh, many of you have heard of IPEC, the group of six professional organizations that have worked diligently to develop a set of core competencies for interprofessional collaborative practice. It is planned that all six professions medicine, nursing, pharmacy, public health, dentistry, and osteopathic medicine will incorporate these core competencies into their respective accreditation standards in the future. Hence, I think we can expect more accreditation changes with even higher expectations for our students in the near future. Focusing now on our position at our respective academic health centers, we have learned through history that we must be seen as valued members of our institutions in order to survive and thrive. There is amazing national pressure for the incorporation of IPE into health professional programs. Fortunately, coupled with this pressure are significant opportunities for resources. Dental schools must be part of this initiative to stay respected and valued partners and to take advantage of funding opportunities. Next, we all compete for the best applicants to dental school. Applicants in the past have asked about performance on board scores, but now applicants are asking other questions. One of these is about an institution's opportunities to work with other health professionals. This generation of applicants is more prone to collaboration than perhaps earlier generations, and they are beginning to see IPE opportunities as a positive and necessary aspect of a school's program. Thank you, Dr. Buchanan. 
Now we want to take an opportunity to hear what you all think about a few particular questions. So throughout this webinar, we're going to have three polling questions. You will, the, the instructions will be explained after I present the question. It's a true or false statement, and it is IPE is a fad that dental schools can opt out of. Kurt, can you tell people how to respond to this poll? Happy to do so, Eugene. The poll is now open on your screen. You have three options, either true, false, or not sure. And we'll give everyone just a few moments to uh, send in that uh, response, and then we'll share the results and look for some comments from our presenters. Again, either click the radio button or the green color, or the, excuse me, the color box to indicate your choice. And we are just about at a complete response. And at this point, we'll go ahead and stop the poll. Thanks for your participation. Uh, please note that your responses to this and all the other polls are anonymous. So we do want to uh, let you know that we're not tracking the exact response from each location. We'll go ahead and stop the poll. Results now being shared, and we have an 86% 86 res 86 response saying false. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Eugene. Thank you, Kurt. So, Judith, what do you think about that? The majority of our audience definitely understand that IPE is not a fad that dental schools can opt out of. Well, I think that's a, a, a very good response. I'm, I'm really excited that the 6% people that answer true are um, interested enough to at least attend this webinar. So uh, to me, that means they're keeping an open mind. Uh, the people that are not sure, the same thing. I'm glad that they are joining this webinar so they can be better informed uh, to maybe make a better decision. So uh, I, th I think it's a, a very interesting response. I definitely agree. It's glad to, we're glad to have all of those folks with us. For any listeners who have recently joined the webinar, welcome to our program. Today's webinar is being presented by the IDEA Policy Center, which supports IDEA's role as the voice of dental education. My name is Eugene Anderson, and I'm the IDEA Chief Policy Officer and Managing Vice President of the IDEA Policy Center. Today with us is Dr. Judith Buchanan discussing the role of dental education in moving IP forward. Dr. Buchanan, what are some of the best practices in IP that exist at some of our U.S. dental schools? Well, there are several examples where institutions have overcome the challenges, and we can learn a lot from their experiences with incorporating IPE into their programs. A few years ago, a study was organized to gather information on IPE in U.S. and Canadian schools. A survey was completed by academic deans, and the data is presented in this publication in the Journal of Dental Education. The article also gave details about IPE initiatives in six schools listed here on this slide. This article uh, contains good information, and I really recommend it for your reading list. Since time is limited, I'd like to focus on three schools and give some caveats from each. These schools are the University of Minnesota, of which I'm the most familiar with, Western University Health Sciences, and the University of Colorado. Let's start with the University of Minnesota. We started in 2008 with a mandated interprofessional ethics course for dental and veterinary students. It was not a success by any measure. But I often learn more from failures than success, and believe me, we learned a lot from this first experience. I'd like to mention failure so that other schools do not let the fear of failing keep them from starting IPE. You mentioned that this early program was mandatory. What is your take on the success of a mandatory IP program versus something that's volunteer for students, voluntary for students or faculty? Well, universities have been support, supporting elective IPE options for 40 years. But when a topic becomes so important and is associated with expected competencies, it, it can't be elective. This is the situation we have now. We expect our students to be competent in basic science, so we wouldn't allow the basic science courses to be elective. 
The same is true for any area where we expect competency. For faculty, involvement in IPE experiences needs to be valued, and especially it has to have weight with promotion and tenure decisions. So learning from our mistakes, uh, we started an academic health center-wide initiative that we named One Health. Branding your initiative, I think, is very important with the name so that people identify courses, initiatives with a particular uh, interprofessional initiative. And like many of the successful initiatives across the U.S., One Health was divided into three phases that corresponded to the early, middle, and late stages of a student's program. Each phase has different expectation, different leaders, and different challenges. The first phase is early immersion and orientation to IPE. The expected outcome from this phase is that students learn a bit about other professions and they understand why IPE and interprofessional collaborative care are important. The second stage is establishing the tools that our students need going into team-based situations. The expectations are that students learn the difference between a working group and a well-functioning team, team dynamics, how to deal with conflict, etc. Unlike Phase 1, where all students take the same course, students in Phase 2 choose opportunities that are best suited to them. These opportunities could be simulation, projects, courses, and so on. Now, the third phase is authentic experiences, working in teams for the betterment of patient health. The expectation for this stage is that our students have the opportunity to use the tools that they developed through the other two phases in actual team-based care. This is the most difficult phase to develop, and it is where the measurement of competencies will be the most important. Our phase one is the most developed, and all students from multiple health professional programs are included medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, veterinary medicine, public health, social work, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and laboratory sciences are included. This means that over a thousand students take the phase one course, foundation of interprofessional collaboration and communication. Now courses like this are logistic nightmares since our course occurs all on the same days but students are divided into interprofessional groups of 12 with a facilitator. That means over 80 small seminar rooms need to be found along with 80 facilitators. Now at the University of Minnesota, to meet the demand for facilitators, we recruited community health care providers, senior students, and some selected staff. The course focuses on learning about other professions team dynamics, ethics, and professionalism. Wow, a thousand students in one course, 80 facilitators. Can you comment on what kind of feedback you received regarding phase one at the University of Minnesota from both faculty and students? Well, before the first offering of phase one, there was skepticism both on the part of students and faculty. But after the first, thing, first year, I think faculty and students could see the value and the potential, but they also had very strong feelings about how to improve it. So we listened very carefully to, to both of those groups, and it's now in its fifth year, and feedback from students and faculty seems to be more positive each year. As I mentioned previously, many initiatives have multiple stages or phases, and ours, like others, have developed and, and implemented them at different times. At the University of Minnesota, we initially initiated our Phase 1 and Phase 2 in 2010, but we just lost, uh, launched our Phase 3 in 2012 with the identification of IPE clinical sites. Now, Phase 3, as I said, is the most difficult phase to implement, 
and our phase three is still maturing and all aspects of One Health are always being evaluated and changing. Now, along the way, beginning with our first disaster, we learned many lessons. First, that dentistry can be a leader, and that was definitely the case at the University of Minnesota. We were both guinea pigs and directors. To be successful with IPE, you need support from all levels, faculty, students, administration, both in your own school and in the institution. The right leadership is important because leaders need to understand that IPE in itself is not the objective but it's the preparation of our students to be valued and experienced team members in practice. Another really important lesson that we learned is that we needed to work with the employers of our graduates and that they were very anxious to play a role in the education of the next generation of healthcare professionals who understand how healthcare is changing. Also, faculty development is, is crucial and resources must be found to help faculty understand both the importance and the methods that can be used in IPE. Now, another institution that is leading the way for all of us is Western University of Health Sciences. Their formal planning for IPE started in 2007, and like Minnesota, has phases that were implemented at different times. At Western, all health professional students take two IPE courses in their first year that are case-based. Now, they have 135 small groups of 13 with the facilitator, so you can imagine the logistics for them. And they discuss a variety of diseases in, across uh, a large age range. In their second year, all students take another two-course series that is divided into modules that cover teams, leadership, communication, ethics, patient advocacy, and professional responsibility. But Western is also moving quickly with experiences in the later years of their program to incorporate team OSCEs and standardized patient experiences these type of experiences allow for assessment of competency to be incorporated. And I really look forward to hearing more about these experiences at future meetings and especially hearing about their assessment strategy. The University of Colorado is also a leader in IPE. In fact, their medical campus was intentionally designed years ago to facilitate collaborative IPE. Keywords that are at the heart of their design are longitudinal integration and creating curricular threads shared across all schools. I think many of us have learned that whatever design you have for IPE, longitudinal integration is important. In other words, just one course in the first year or just one experience in the last year is not sufficient. It's not going to be accepted well by students nor is it going to make them team practice ready. IPE must be reinforced continually throughout their program, and having curricular threads that are shared across all schools help unify students and reinforces the message. So having a sustained IPE focus throughout all four years of dental education appears to be essential for success, correct? Absolutely. Students may come into programs with biased or stereotypical views of other professions, and learning to respect, understand, and collaborate with other health professions can be a significant culture change. A change. Learning to work in as a team takes time, and so having longitudinal reinforcement of the necessary behavior to collaborate helps make our graduates collaborative practice ready. Like any skill, it takes time to develop, and having uh, this reinforcement over our, the four years or uh, three years of a program really instills the basics of, of collaborative practice. Can you continue 
talking about your example at the University of Colorado for us? Yes. Uh, the University of Colorado fully implemented their mandatory IPE coursework in 2010. Instead of phases, their initiative is comprised of four components, fundamentals of collaborative care, ethics, clinical transformation, and interprofessional clinical rotations. One facet of their program, which I think is especially important to note, is their assessment strategy. Now, this is an area where we all are struggling with as we try to find ways to measure competency. In their second year course called Interprofessional Education Development, the University of Colorado has several assessments. The IRAT, which is Individual Readiness Assurance Test, the TRAT, which is Team Readiness Assurance Test, Team Performance Assessments, a comprehensive assessment of team member effectiveness, or CATME, and a final exam. So these are some excellent examples of how one school is trying to measure student competency, and, and we can all learn from their experience. There are several things to note in looking at these schools. One, uh, dental faculty have played some very important roles in most of the examples of best practices. We are perceived as knowing how to work in teams. Uh, we work with an assistant well and a hygienist and now are trying to incorporate a dental therapist into our team. And we are considered as neutral in maybe some historical struggles uh, between nursing, medicine, and pharmacy. But we're also viewed as being good clinicians. Thanks, Dr. Buchanan. We're now going to take our second audience poll question, true, false, or not sure. Dental educators need to be leaders in IPE, even if the practice community has not yet adapted, adopted the collaborative model. True, false, or not sure. And that question is now before you on the uh, poll screen. And again, please note your responses are anonymous. And we'll take a moment to gather this information. Uh, I know there was a question that came in through the chat regarding access to the PowerPoint presentation. And Adia provided information that says the PowerPoint will be provided on our website along with the recording. And I believe that's posted within about a week of the presentation. We're nearly done with the responses here. If you'd like to complete those in the next five or so seconds, We'll then share the results and look for comments from our presenters. And we have now stopped the poll and let me share those results. And it looks like we have 88% agreeing that it is true. With that, back to you, Eugene. Thank you, Kurt. So 88% believe it's true that dental educators need to be leaders in IP, even if the practice community has not yet adopted the collaborative model. Dr. Buchanan, you want to comment on this? Well, I think that's an excellent response, and I'm so glad so many people feel that way. Uh, in our experience, and, and I'm sure if you talk to many of the other best practices, uh, dentistry, um, because of their knowledge of competency and assessment, we really can, we really have a lot to offer in helping to develop IPE at, at various academic health centers. So 88%, I think that's um, very good that people think that way. Great. As a reminder, today's webinar is being presented by the American Dental Education Association. To learn more about ADEA, we encourage you to visit ADEA's website at www.adea.org. And to learn more about the IDEA Policy Center, we encourage you to click on the Policy tab on the IDEA website. Today, Dr. Judith Buchanan is discussing the role of dental education in moving IPE forward. Dr. Buchanan, how can our listeners help move IPE forward? Well, every academic health center or university is at a different point on the spectrum of fully integrating IPE. And depending on where your institution is, you either need to help it get started, get more involved with initial efforts, or be focused on helping your institution move the whole effort forward to its full potential. Now, if your institution has little in the way of IPE, you can be a tremendous help. 
Thinking back on the different phases that several of the schools use, which phase would match with your interest and expertise? If you're interested in ethics, communication, helping students learn facts about other professions, then you need to focus on starting with beginning students. So phase one courses or experiences would be the area that you would like to or you would be most suited for. If you're interested in simulation or basics of teams, you could focus on mid-level students. If you're a clinician, uh, think of clinical situations where teams could be utilized for senior students and find others on your campus that have that similar interest and form a network. Look for faculty development programs locally or nationally. And using your network, talk with other institutions to gain insight on how they started. Depending on resources or just your comfort le level, Plan something small or larger scale, but just get something started. If your institution has started IPE initiatives, find out who's leading the efforts. Learn as much as you can about the current offerings. If the IPE programs do not include dental students or faculty, uh, find out why. Of, oftentimes it seems that dentistry was offered a place at the table, but it did not want to participate at that time, uh, and that was never asked again. The reasons could have been leadership or lack of resources or the school not understanding the role dentistry can play in interprofessional collaboration. Brainstorm as to how dentistry can participate and offer to help get dentistry involved. Become a champion for IPE at your school. There's so many resources to help you put together a great presentation and then offer it for departmental meetings or lunch and learns. Or ask your dean to bring in speakers from institutions where dentistry is involved in IPE to talk about their experiences and how they overcame the challenges in their school. Really get students involved. They are great change agents at any school, as I'm sure you all uh, can verify. And there are um, many good professional meetings and symposiums now on IPE. Find the resources to attend. You can look at both school and institutional sources or attend many of the IPE-related sessions at the IDEA meetings. Learn everything you can about IPE and interprofessional collaborative care and get involved. Because for young faculty, this can be central to your career development. Or if you're mid or late career, it can really re-energize your faculty development or research. That's great advice. Do you have some resources you would suggest our members take a look at? Yes, they do, and the participants can find three excellent ones at the end of this memora, uh, webinar on the reference slide. I really encourage you to read the California Dental Journal that came out recently. The whole journal is, is uh, dedicated to the subject of why dentistry should be part of interprofessional collaborative care. And, and also coming up, I have some great suggestions for professional meetings on IPE. Fantastic. Do you want to say more about that? Uh, we will. We'll uh, keep moving along here. Uh, if you're fortunate to be at where IPE is alive and well and included uh, includes dentistry, you know, how can you move IPE forward? Well, first try to participate as much as you can in the IPE courses uh, simulation or clinical experiences. Really one of the most important areas that we need right now is the development of good assessment tools to measure competency. We in dentistry have been very good at developing assessment tools and although behavior change may be harder to evaluate than clinical skills, we as dental educators may be the most experienced at our institution in competency evaluations. Once we've developed varied assessment tools, we need, a, we need good research to document the efficiency and adequacy 
of our IPE initiatives. This is a wide open area that will have many opportunities for funding. And in the references that we're going to show you in a minute, it is a link to the National Center for Interprofessional Education and Collaboration that's housed at the University of Minnesota. They, are, they have been well-funded, and it's their job to give resources to people and to be a showcase for what other schools are doing. You can also work with other professionals to design and implement research projects, form an IPE research interest group, and work collaboratively, sort of practice what you preach. Once the research is done and analyzed, present your findings at local and international meetings. Since IPE is interprofessional, you may find yourself presenting at meetings far outside the dental field. Of course, the ultimate goal should be to publish your findings. No matter where your institution is on the IPE scale, there are opportunities to help your school get started, to get involved in current IPE initiatives, and to really help move IPE forward at your institution and nationally. Thanks, Dr. Buchanan. Can you say a little bit more about some of the professional development opportunities related to IPE? Yes, in, in just a, a minute I'll give you some um, excellent uh, suggestions for, for meetings. Uh, but I want to make the point that no matter whether your program is public or private or whether you're on a large campus or uh, a small one, there are definitely ways to be involved in IPE, and I think we've mentioned this uh, a couple of times now. And there's also examples of, of schools that are probably very similar to you and uh, how they have been able to implement IPE. So no matter where you are, your institution is in the um, sorry. Uh, where you are, your institution is, there, these meetings are, can be very helpful to you. The first are the IPEC Institutes. The IPEC Institutes are held to bring together faculty from across the health disciplines in order to work collaboratively to explore how to incorporate IPE student learning experiences into their curriculum. The overall goal of each IPEC institute is create faculty champions to enhance interprofessional curriculum and student learning experiences through team-focused activities, designing an institutional-based project. The next uh, IPEC institute is October the 1st through the 3rd, 2014 in Virginia. These institutes usually reach maximum level limits in a week, so I don't know if the registration is still open. However, we're fortunate that Dr. Valakovic is very good at informing us of future institutes, so look out for his emails on the subject. These are uh, meetings where you take a team from your institution, and from what I've heard, they're excellent, and people have really learned a lot in attending these institutes, and I think that's why they're so popular. Now, collaborating across borders provides a venue for American and Canadian health professionals, policymakers, educators, and students to discuss issues in interprofessional education practice and policy by featuring best practices, providing evidence-supporting efforts, showcasing outcomes, and describing lessons learned. These meetings are held every other year, alternating between venues in Canada and the United States. And the fifth CAB meeting is going to be held September 29th through October the 2nd in Roanoke, uh, Virginia. Thanks, Dr. Buchanan. For the sake of time, we're going to go ahead to our final poll and then open it up for the audience to ask us some questions, okay? Okay, okay. So the third polling question, true, false, or not sure, my dental school is ready for IPE. And the question now before our audience, and uh, again, please note, uh, you have three choices, true, false, or not sure. 
uh, responses are anonymous, and uh, as we are about to move into the question and answer session, just a reminder, you can send your questions through the general chat. You'll find, you'll find a white space at the very bottom of that area. All you need to do is type in your question and either press enter or click send. Questions are, are being shared and comments are being shared with the audience, and our presenters will deal with as many questions as possible in the time we have allotted, and we have about 12 minutes remaining for the program. We'll go ahead and stop this particular poll, and uh, it looks to me as I share the results that we have a 57% uh, responding true, but 35% not sure. With that, I'll turn it to our presenters for comment. Thank you, Kurt. So this one's a little closer than the previous two. So 57% feel that their school, institution, or program is ready for IPE. We've got 7% that don't feel they're ready, and then we've got about a third, a little over a third, that feel that they're not sure. Uh, Dr. Buchanan, any words of advice for those in the not sure category? How can they be sure? Well, I think for about 35%, that this is an excellent opportunity then for them to be the leaders at their institution. And so that they can do things like being the champion to make sure all of the faculty and students are well informed about why IPE is important. Uh, and, and I think that's great that 35% of the people who are not sure uh, hopefully we'll go home today with some ideas of how they can help their institution be ready for IPE. And I'm, of course, glad to see that 57% feel that their institution is already ready for IPE. Okay, great. Now turning to questions that we've been receiving from our participants, Dr. Buchanan, we have many allied health educators participating in today's webinar. Is the dental team, as it's defined with dentists and allied dental professionals working together, is that considered in a professional education or is there another way of describing that interaction? That, that is commonly termed intra-professional. And although people view us as being very good at intra-professional collaboration, I think we have a long way yet to go, and we the potential is so much greater. Um, but that's also if we increase our ability to work intra-professionally, I think that's going to help us with the mindset that we need to have to work interprofessionally. So I, I, I'm very glad, and at, at a lot of our meetings and uh, other venues where we talk about IPE, a lot of allied people are coming, and I think that's great. We just need to make sure that um, the whole dental team learns how to work together, and in using those tools, we can apply it to working with other health professions. Now, related to that question, what advice would you offer for allied dental educators who are in a community college setting uh, push the envelope. Contact the the, the nearest uh, dental school. Um, see if you can get something going. But it doesn't have to be in some, some of the allied uh, dental people have not, um, for some reason or another, have chosen other professions to work with. So they look towards nursing or social work. Um, and, and other professions that they can learn a lot of these same tools. So you just have to think outside the box, be really creative, and, and very aggressive and assertive, and find partners to, to expose your students to. Great. Another question we received relates to the starting point for IP at an institution. Does it have to be from the top down, or can it move from the bottom up? It's best if it, if it operates both ways. Uh, you, you know, you do need some um, resources, so having top leadership on board, but you can't do it without bottom up. You need the students and the faculty to, to be on board. So it, it it really is kind of a culture change, and it has to happen.
sort of simultaneously at different levels. Um, students, as I said, are great change agents, and they can push uh, initiatives like no other group in a dental school. And then you can convince people that might be on a borderline into being fully on board. But you do need some resources. Uh, you need the academic dean on board. Um, so you, you've got to have some help at every level. Okay. Another question we received is regarding assessment. Without a formal assessment tool, how do we best assess IPE? That is a really big question, and, and that is what many people are working on, and that's why this is such an open field for uh, research. Uh, we're starting to have some good um, examples of assessment at, at some of the schools that are a little bit more advanced. Uh, but we, we need to see if the assessments are really measuring what we want them to measure and if they're really measuring things that will help us be uh, collaboration ready. Um, so it, it is very difficult to develop assessments for team dynamics and individuals in a team and the team as a whole. And I think that's why I gave the example of the University of Colorado. I think they are having some very interesting uh, examples that may, may prove to be exactly the way to go, but um, we need more research to look at that. So th that's a real struggle that everybody is working with. What kind of assessments can we use? What are some examples? And how can we show that we're really measuring competencies with these assessments? Okay, thank you. And we have time for one last question. What are some of the best ways to engage faculty on interprofessional education? If one, it has to be valued from higher ups. So the dean has to see a value. Now, at many academic uh, health centers, the university is pushing it, and so they're tying, tying funds to schools that are, are really actively involved in IPE. So the dean has to be, the, the dean and resources uh, have to be in, involved too, but it has to be seen uh, at the school as a positive thing for faculty to be involved in IPE. It can't be just another um, responsibility added to overworked faculty already. And the promotion and tenure documents are, uh, have to include and value interprofessional uh, teaching and experiences. And, and that's been something that's held IPE back is that it wasn't valued and it wasn't part of promotion and, and tenure decisions. Thanks, Dr. Buchanan. Any final comments as we come to the close of this webinar? Well, it's been a pleasure and I was so glad to see that so many people uh, are interested in this and I hope that they'll uh, go to some of these meetings and share their experiences and that we continue to work collaboratively to push IPE forward. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Buchanan, for being with us for this month's webinar. And thank, to, thank you to all our participants throughout the past hour. Before I turn it over to Kurt for some final comments regarding the evaluation in CE, I want to let all our participants know that shortly we will be sending out information about next month's webinar, which will be on September 30th, starting at noon Eastern time. So sit tight, you'll hear more information in the coming days about the September webinar. Thank you all for being with us. Kurt, over to you. Thank you, Eugene, and that concludes today's presentation, Moving IPE Forward, the Role for Dental Education, brought to you by the American Dental Education Association and presented by Dr. Judith Buchanan. 
your host and moderator for the program was Dr. Excuse me, just a moment. Uh, excuse me, was Dr. Eugene Anderson. We do hope everyone enjoyed the presentation. As a reminder, we do ask you to take a moment and complete the evaluation that will appear momentarily on your screen. Please stay connected so that you can see that evaluation. Your comments and suggestions are important as it helps us provide you with future quality programming. Please uh, reference your materials for instructions about obtaining CE for this presentation, which includes the completion of that evaluation. Your handouts include the steps necessary to re uh, receive that continuing education credit. Please be sure to follow Adia Webb on Twitter and join the conversation using the hashtags interprofessional and IPE. You can find the recording and presentation of the program at www.adia.org forward slash moving IPE forward and that will be posted one week from today. Today's program is copyrighted in 2014 by the American Dental Education Association, all rights reserved. Thank you all for joining us for the program and enjoy the rest of your day and the evaluation will appear now.